maybe that's what all those warning messages were about last week was that they were making changes i don't know um but it looks uh the thing looks a little different what which part the facebook piece yeah, or the zoom going, going zoom going to facebook so it the the way that they uh, go in is a little different. It's um, it seems to ask for more permissions. Oh, okay. yeah, those warning messages were about oh. last week. Okay, so um, so maybe now I'll know for sure when we go online because there's <laughs> a <laughs> that's cool. Uh, let's see, some kind of playback button. Um, actually, it just automatically played back and I got a screen up, usually the screen that I have to wait until somebody makes a comment on to then share it. Um, okay, so I need to edit this. So I need to, okay, so where are you in the list? That's not easy. Why? Oh my gosh, there. Okay, where is that option? There's not, that's not easy. All right, so that's not happening. And let's see if I can, I'm changing that to public. And um, and it's not giving you, me your name as an option to say that I'm online with you. It's like, what is that about? Um, anyway, um, I guess I'll have to go back and tag you after the fact. Oh, that's fine. Mm. Anyway, um, so good morning. Good morning. Top of the morning to yes. all of you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am, um, <clears throat> this has been um, a rough morning so far for me. And um, whew, a switch from yesterday, y'all. <laughs> yesterday, I came in here on a high and um, and I lost two cousins this week. I might as well say it, um, say it at the top of the hour. Um, and I don't even know how to say it. This is just so mm -hmm. hard, especially when they're, you know, young people. And um, yeah. Yeah, um, so uh, my cousin, Darlene Tony, most of y'all know her as Dee Dee. Um, her son was shot and killed um, last night. Okay, Stephanie, can you do us a prayer? I sure can, I sure can. I think that's a great idea. Dear Mother, Father God, we give you praise for this moment right now. Um, we are excited and expecting answers where there seems to be no answers. We are expecting peace when they're in a space right now where there seems to be no peace. Comfort right now, we are standing and sending out an energy of comfort to Sandra, her family, and um, the other family who's lost loved ones, just sending out a spirit of comfort and peace and assurance um, that you are there, that your presence is there, that all that we need is here for us now. I just ask for a comforting spirit to just cover our dear friend Sandra and her family right now and we thank you for always being all that you are to us for us near us through us 
we declare that. And so it is. And so it is. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so here, here's one of the wonderful things about meditation that I experience. Um, and I will tell you guys, all of us have this ability to experience when you are a person who meditates, you learn how to take that jumble of thoughts and I can move that. It, it's almost like you get to scoop it up as a, as an entire body and move that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I am declaring now that I'm gonna sit it over here on the shelf so that we can do what we gotta do here. And then um, I can go and do what I gotta do in order to support, um, yeah, to support family and um, all of that stuff. So I'm here now and um, yeah, it's, it's um it's it's all it's all my other cousin was in Mississippi and mm -hmm. um got was on um ran out of gas got out of the car and apparently a truck was um in and, and I don't know if you guys know or have ever been to Mississippi but um a Mississippi black is is no joke I have walked um outside in Mississippi and you literally can't see your hand um as kids and this is and, and and to think about this is so so dangerous um but when we were younger we would you know my my granddad had a whole big old farm and we would um you know we'd go down the street to the juke joint because you know you feel like you in the in the house all day all you and all your cousins you're in the house and you're stuck in there and and, you know, so we would walk down the road to the juke joint, but by the time we were leaving out at night, and the juke joint is just some rickety um, <laughs> barn that somebody put a jukebox in and they'll sell you some, some something to drink. And so you go and you make your own party. And, um, and so sometimes we stay down there at the jig joint having, you know, whatever fun we have. And, and then by the time we leave out, it's dark. And so I can recall walking down the road and because we couldn't see the sides of the road, we had to link arms and we would walk in the middle because somebody could fall into a ditch and you not be able to find, mm -hmm. you know? Wow. Um, and and so it was crazy. So you just would link arms so that because it makes no sense to, you know, just people talk and 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 try to detect where their voices are. You got to link arms. And so can you imagine if a truck was to come plowing down the street? Because that's what you do really in those back roads. You put on your high beams and you go plowing down the thing. Well, you never know, you know, you right. never, never know um, whether you're going to be around a bin and somebody not see you before they plow into you. As mm -hmm. a matter of fact, that's how my grandmother was killed in Mississippi. She was hit by a car walking on a road because there's mm. street lights out there. It's just when it's dark, it's dark, it's, it's dark. And so, um, yeah, so Andre was killed um, by a car, by a truck um, this past weekend. And so it's just been um, just one of those weekends. And so I am just, um, I'm, I'm just going to be prayerful through all of this and surround them with love and um, yeah, knowing knowing that you know we don't see it now and i don't even know that it's it's the time to call it call clarity to it but um you know one of the things i think is is that we pathologize a lot of stuff first off we make assumptions oh you know first off we think somebody's killed must have been doing something wrong not necessarily no right um and then we then we pathologize it or we act as if I, I saw somebody, a friend of mine's was posting on there talking about 
um, she was trying to get past somebody's death. And then it's like, it's only been two weeks. I'm like, give yourself a break, you know? I mean, oh. at, at a certain point, we got to, we got to recognize that there is a natural process that all of us go through um, when we're dealing with something. And some of us, it takes way longer than others. And depending upon the relationship or, you know, whether it was a spouse or a child or, you know, or somebody that was close to you, it may take even longer. I know, um, you know, I thought my, you know, my mother was, you know, was the worst thing ever. And then my father, but, you know, I, I would, I, I'm going to tell y'all, it is really different too when you lose a pet because, uh, you know, I'm not saying that it's uh, the, the, the relationship is comparable, but all of a sudden your house is empty. All of a right. sudden it's like, wow, you know. It's a loss. Right. It's like, so so these things are not to be taken lightly it um allow yourself the room and the space and um the generous be generous with yourself when yeah. it comes down to um loss yes to the loss yes thank you yeah because we don't we know because we don't we don't grieve i mean that's our biggest the biggest uh contributor to in my humble opinion to you know, mental health, depression, and anxiety is that people don't grieve. They're not given permission to grieve and they're not learned how to grieve. They don't understand that if you have one experience and you haven't grieved the one prior to that, when the other new experience comes, now you got to grieve all of it because grief will have its way. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, you know, handling loss is, 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 is a, is a, is, is something that we need to practice. And we, we don't, we have not in our society, we don't give permission to practice loss. Like the women at the wailing wall, there's there are some cultures that it's intentional. Like you spend that time in a place of mourning and loss and with the Jewish people and they sit for the seven days or 10 days that they sit Shivas, I think is what it's called. And so like a lot of cultures give time for that. Mm -hmm. But our culture and society doesn't give a, a lot of credence to loss. And we got a lot of loss, especially in right. our community, <laughs> right. people of color. And if you're not given a space and given permission to grieve and to be sad and to be angry and to feel orphaned and all the things that come with loss, then you, you get compound grief, which now becomes complex. And it's just, it's just important for us to take care of ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I I'm I'm one of those do the ugly cry and yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. but but I also know that so I'm I'm gentle enough with myself to do the ugly cry when I need to, but also know that I can now pick this up and I can sit it aside and I'm gonna say, all right, I'm gonna get right back to you. <laughs> Cause I know that that process is a necessary process. Mm -hmm. And so we need to stop taking pills for that stuff and just go <laughs> yes. through it. You know, when I first started having my power surges, um, I used to go into the doctor's office and I was complaining because they were coming so frequently, you know, like every 18 minutes I could just, wow. you know, and here it comes and it comes in like, just like fire. And, um, and they were always trying to get me to take um, those you know, the hormone replacement mm -hmm. or HTR or something like that. And, you know, I was saying all of that, all that does is, is it postpones those symptoms. It doesn't get rid of the symptoms. And so that means that I would have to take those pills for the rest of my life. And I was like, yeah, let me just go through it. Let me well, just- face the music, right? Yeah. <laughs> let me just power through it and, and be done with it instead right. of acting as if it's not something that I need to deal with. And so, right. you know, I know that for some people it's harder because- um, you know, some people get embarrassed by that stuff or somehow think that there's something wrong with a natural process that your body goes through. 
I am not one of those, you know, <laughs> well, I am not that girl. So <laughs> if, if you had to see me out someplace looking like I was leaking all over, that's fine with me. <laughs> I was leaking some awesome stuff. <laughs> you should have touched it a little bit, <laughs> some that, like some holy water. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so welcome to Monday and um, to this edition of Morning Glory. I'm so glad that you guys are with us. And um, thank you, Stephanie, um, for that love and support. I appreciate you. Thank you. Still sending it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, so um, today, um, you know, I want to get back to what we have kind of kept like um, talking about touching on and backing off, touching on and backing off. Um, because yesterday we ran out of time. Day before that, we ran out of time. So <laughs> let's get into it. Um, right off the bat, I guess we will um, have the ability maybe to power through this and have a conversation about redirecting our our energy or our power. You know, sometimes people ask me about this because they don't recognize or even understand that that they that they have power right because it is just what we have always used to animate our lives mm -hmm. and so it is this energy this power that we are talking about is um you know i i I, I guess I want to relate it to, was it the first time that I saw and understood death? Um, I, was, I was next to my mother when she took her last breath. And there she was, and um, her mind was, she was seeing different stuff. So she was talking to you know, and doing the death rasp and we, you know, me and my father are standing there and, um, and she took in, it was like, she took in her last breath and she kind of just smiled, pressed her lips together and smiled like, now take that. <laughs> Cause I will, I will say that me and my dad were standing over my mother arguing because, and we were arguing, I, I, I'll admit it, because my dad wanted to, um, first he wanted to call an ambulance. And it was like, no, she was clear. She wanted to die at home, never in a hospital. She was due. So then he says, well, let's at least plug her up to that oxygen machine that they brought. And I was like, nope. She said, no machines and no hospital. We had been through this. And my mother was really clear about her, um, about her directives, about what she wanted to happen. And so we're standing up there and we're arguing. And my dad is beside himself because I wasn't, I wasn't doing what he wanted me to do. I wasn't, I was like saying, no, you know, and every step of the way, because my mother was so clear about um, not wanting to be on any artificial machinery or anything like that, because she was so clear about it, um, I didn't have a problem with just respecting her her wishes. Um, good morning, Gretchen, and good morning, Erica. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Erica. you for, for your thoughts. I, you know, the new way that they have this set up, I have to look for where the comments were are because I didn't see them yesterday, and oh. uh, so, um, so now I have to look for where the comments are. So there we are. So, um. So she was really clear about how she wanted this to go, right? She didn't want to be in the hospital where we had to sit and 
um, you know, amongst other people and where they clean you out of the room as soon as she didn't want all of that stuff. So she was like, okay, no, I want to be at home. I want to, you know, she, she had her, her, her ideas about what she wanted. And I had the idea that we were going to respect that. So we were standing up there arguing about it and um, she took her last breath and, you know, she just pierced her lips together, pursed her lips together and she kind of smiled as if to say, here, take that, right? Y'all y'all can stop arguing about this mess. I'm going to solve it right here. And so, um, and so, you know, it was, it was like one of those things. It was, it was one minute she's there and and her heart is beating and there's an energy to her and the next minute it's like it just like turned off mm. it just stopped and so when we think about energy i think that one of one of the things that i saw in that moment was this animation whether it's the movement or the heartbeat or the breathing there is this thing called life which is an energy in and of itself that animates this body suit that we wear, right? It is the presence of us that is in there. And you know it's there because there is, I mean, the, the skin begins to change, you know, it's like you get a, um, when, when that leaves you, you know when the energy is gone. It is, mm. You know, some people will talk about, oh, put a mirror up under their nose and see if you can detect any breath or feel for a heartbeat. But, you know, it's it's kind of like you just, you see that there is a withdrawal of this energy. So this energy is always present. And it is when we are alive, when we're in, when this consciousness is in my body, it is present and it is apparent. But when it leaves, it is also so what do we do with that energy that we have when we are here, when we are in our body? And so that is this thing, this, this indwelling spirit that, um, that we are speaking about when we talk about this energy and what we do with it and how we, you know, whether we, whether we draw it in and use it for our benefit or whether or not we're projecting it out then what blocks it in too? Because there's this implosion that we do too when we're not like, you know, having this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, it gets caught. Or some people use a language like stuck. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. stuck in a space where there is no movement. There is no flow. Yeah. Yeah, um, this this new setup is confusing to me. Yeah, so 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 um, and so sometimes what we don't recognize is is that we block ourselves, right? We block ourselves when we disconnect from other people. So the so, the thought that somehow we are separate, or um, the thought that we are judging. Um, the, the non-forgiveness stuff blocks and causes blockages in our flow. All of these things become part of um, whether or not we got good energy that's clean and flowing out from us or not. So all of that stuff counts. So when we talk about redirecting this and we use it, I, I use... Um, the terms energy and um, power, all of those things kind of interchangeably, consciousness, all of those things, they use them interchanged and, or interchangeably and, um, and basically use it in that kind of way. I'm sorry, y'all, I'm just like, so um, this, this new setup, the framework on it, doesn't allow me to see the comments and okay maybe i'm gonna click on something else and see so stephanie do you are do you have your book present i do let's start I over do. at the top of 53 okay i'm gonna see if i can get this um i don't understand how to get this Okay. 
I'm going to read this first portion. I know you read it yesterday, I think, but I just want to read it again. Changing our lives is often difficult because of our existing loyalties. Usually, um, we learn about loyalties within our family structure and as a connection towards our family. Loyalty to oneness, however, is an entirely different type, is a different virtue. And inherently, uh, and inherently to it can cause tremendous upheaval in a family. Um, okay, so wait a minute, wait a minute. So stop right there. So, so it says in there, so you said loyalty to oneself is yes. an entirely different virtue. Yes. So, so here's the thing is that most people are taught that being loyal to yourself is being selfish. selfish. Mm -hmm. Most people are taught to always be other focused and to never think about themselves first. Cause that is like, I mean, for so many people that is almost like, um, just, I mean, especially for the female cult, the female species in our society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and so, so, and, and depending upon what culture you are in, um, cause there's a cultural thing where, you know, where, um, you know, in, in, when people were enslaved cultures is as if they were possessions and property and to be more concerned outwardly with somebody else, um, than they were for themselves or whatever that may mean. It, they could, you know, that loyalty to oneself wasn't even a, a, a notion. It wasn't even something that you can consider. Then you, after being in that, that thing and never doing the healing work as a result right. of that, then you come out and, and now all of a sudden you are trying to, to, figure out in this new paradigm that now that you are an autonomous being, now you're trying to figure out something else. You go from being mere property chattel to then trying to figure out, okay, Person, what, good. What the heck? Yeah, right, right. What does it mean to be loyal to oneself when this idea of selfhood has been stripped away? And, and if you can remember back to the movie Roots, I mean, so, so many of us, um, as we watch Kunta Kinte fight for the right to have his name, no, you are going to be Toby. I mean, just to try to break somebody's spirit to the point where you can no longer own and call yourself you are. what you are. That is a, a, a demonstration of somebody's spirit being broke down systematically and then to be born into something where now all of a sudden your father was broke down and broken spirited and, and had to give up his identity, his name, everything that he knew. And, and how he had to give it up. Yes. He's going to protect you from that. Yes. And then generation after generation after generation, that becomes part of the narrative. So yes. this idea of loyalty to oneself is not something that is small. It is huge. Because and it first feels off, like, it, it can feel like a ripping if we had to create a, a physical um, a description of it. It can, can feel like a literally ripping of the flesh. When, mm -hmm. when people decide to step out of an enmeshed environment into an independent environment, it can feel like a ripping, literal tear is mm -hmm. described by some to decide to be loyal to myself and, you know, and still try to be connected to the family. Right. You know, because sometimes, okay, so, so. So now, let, so, so let's shift back here. It says that usually we learn about loyalty within our family structure as a consciousness towards our family. Now, so, so you just brought in the family element back into that. 
So what does it mean all of a sudden when you are dealing with a family and your family is basically telling you, um, has taught you how to be safe in the sense of, um, you know, don't rock the boat, don't be too loud, don't be too big, don't, you know, stay in your place. Um, you know, don't have any dreams because right. all that happens to you is when you dream, um, you're going you gonna to be cut. So there is this, this messaging over and over again through our families to stay in place, yes. right? Don't go chasing waterfalls, right? right. That's right. what, that's what the, and, and what we see nowadays is, is that people are really trying to do that. Like, okay, my family is not going to support my dream or my vision or, or whoever it is. If they're not supporting the dream or the vision, there is a point at which in order to be loyal to yourself, you have to then figure out what is it that I need to do in order to, for me to be loyal to myself at the same time, recognize that I'm in a family structure that may not respect that. And that becomes this kind of like, you feel like you're being a tug of war is being played on you. And it's, it's, over there is them and over here is that future self that you are trying yep. to get to yeah right mm -hmm. so so that's the push and the pull of this mm -hmm. and giving up the struggle because it's a it's a sweet struggle right it is a sweet struggle that all of us go through um most people go through this struggle and they call it adolescence <laughs> You know, it, it, it intensifies when as, as adolescents, we're really trying to find where we are in the world. But then after you get to a certain age and you figure out that you're unhappy and you don't know why you're unhappy, how do I be, get to be happy? Oh, is there a self that I need to right. consider? And that's where a lot of families don't make the turn. Yeah. Yeah. That's when things, you know, they want to continue to try to create a homeostasis in an environment where that little person is not a little person anymore. And, and, and if we as a society could learn that that's where we need to, instead of waiting until they leave to go to university, I used to say we raise our children as Christians and then we send them to Babylonian schools where we could, if we think that there's information out there for them on their 20s that they could get to be free, they can start being free at 12. You can start letting it open it up a little bit more because we're going to get to where you're talking about. We're going to get to a place where we want to differentiate from our family of origin because there's assignments that we all have to do. But if we can know that when a child is 10 and 11 and 12 and start giving that space so they can have their own loyalty to themselves, oh, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, even Jesus said, you know, when his mother went looking for him, he yes. said, I got to be awesome. Yes. Right? Yes. And so, and so each of us comes with a business that we got to be about. We yes. got to get to it. And it is not some, it's sometimes it'll feel like it is um, a betrayal or yes. uh, a leaving behind. Ungratefulness. <laughs> Ungrateful. Ungrateful. Yeah. <laughs> all of that. I mean, all of that. Because, because what happens is, is at a certain point, we do have to be about the business to which we, only we were born for, yeah. that only we can do. Yeah. And it's so, and, and, and unless and until we get to that, we are busy, like, you know, having this, 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 Oh my God, it's like a fire within us yes. that is just, you know, so for me, I remember, and I talk about this often, um, cause you know, before I got ordained, I was, I was having a struggle with getting into ministry. I was just like sitting up there saying, no, right. No, I, even though I felt the push, I was like, you know, get off my back. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was resistant. I was so resistant and I was resistant for so many reasons. I mean, I just had a whole list of reasons why not. 
but it was something that it was, you know, that that was pulling me. It was, you know, pulling, pushing, all of that stuff. But until I said yes, I didn't even get the 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 upgrade that I was supposed to get up here. Mm, I like that. That's good. Yeah. You know, so, a picture that came to me, um, Sandy, um, is uh, the acorn, but a giant oak tree standing on the inside of it. It just kind okay. of popped into my head when you said that. Like, yeah. like I'm an oak tree. I'm an oak tree. I'm an oak tree, says the acorn. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. right. And sometimes you, you're resisting that, right? Because yeah, yeah. sometimes it's more comfortable to stay small for some mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. That staying small is just be, has become their reality. But but the other part of that is, is, is that, you know, staying small also cost us something because say, for instance, you, you could stay small and still operate on the 50 percent of the energy wattage that you were supposed to get when 100 watts is supposed to be running through you. But you rather stay small. Yeah. So how do we then increase our ability, our capacity to to get bigger? So um, let me let me uh, so let me so it says loyalty to oneself, however, is an entirely different virtue and adhering to it can cause tremendous upheaval in the family. And so that upheaval will have people, um, you know, taking it personally thinking that somehow you are um, doing something to them. They don't see that, that what you are moving towards is your own bigness because they want you to stay the same. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it, and sometimes that's just not possible. Um, all of this stuff changes us becoming loyal to herself. And so we're switching because I think we were talking about somebody before becoming loyal to herself may for instance cause a woman to recognize that she can no longer remain within her marriage mm -hmm. upon sharing this information with her husband she will be told think of the children her case is an extremely common example of group loyalty conflicting with loyalty to oneself mm -hmm. While living in an unsatisfactory situation, we may try for a while to honor the demands of group loyalty, loyalty, and we may avoid thinking about our personal emotional needs. But at some point, however, our emotional body becomes sufficiently empowered that our mind can no longer fool the heart. That's all good. <laughs> yes yes and and you know here oh. when it says think of the kids sometimes people make the assumption that the kids are the problem and it's not always the kids that's the problem it's the oh y'all you know they're um in that show it was a series called lovecraft country i don't know if y'all saw that because it was on hbo and um, in there, there was this character named Hippolyta. Okay. And Hippolyta had had an experience. So it, and, and it kind of reminds me of the way that I get intuitive hits and what happened to me yesterday morning in the, in the woods and seeing myself in these different scenarios. And so Hippolyta had this experience where she was going in and out of these different experiences that was happening to her. And when she finally got back to where she was having a conversation with her husband, she said something to him like, um, you know, he was, they were having this conversation and she was like, um, she stayed small to be in the marriage. And he was like, I didn't want you to stay small. And she was like, yeah, but you didn't want me to be you big, be big either. <laughs> uh, yes, superhero powers. Yes, Nicia. And, and, 
And so, I, you know, I forget exactly how the conversation, the exact words of it was, but, but she recognized the exchange that she made. In I love that word. Yeah. Us. yeah. And, and so it becomes about us finding our truth and then having the courage to move towards that. Exactly. And it's not, it's not because of, you know, it, you know, in Hippolyta's case, it, her and her husband seemed to have this amazing relationship. They loved one another, but she, what she recognized was, is that she needed to stay small in order to stay in it. Mm. Um, at this point, I think he had already made his transition. Um, but it was it was one of those aha moments for her. And and sometimes it's the aha moment that many of us need to have. Like, what does it mean? What does it mean to live out my bigness? You know, mm -hmm. that's but a yeah, really good question. Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes, you know, we don't even recognize that we're playing small. We don't even recognize the things that we do in order to maneuver in certain situations. We go into the workplace and sometimes we try not to outshine people, right? Because you know how you you know how you have worked for people that 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 are less intelligent, are less <laughs> capable, healed, less yeah, uh -huh. all of this stuff. And you are so busy trying to not step on their toes showing them some respect and it and it just seems like you just kind of like you, you want to fly yeah or the person who's always like oh i know the answer oh i know the answer and then eventually you don't give the answer you just wait around for the next person to give the answer and you just let it go past maybe answer question number four yeah. even though you know you just kind of resist mm -hmm. showing up Re but resist showing up so cost us yeah they cost us when we play small oh you know well, let me um where uh, <laughs> ah, here we are I, so i like my new office setup <laughs> Although I, you know, I don't know if that's that if that was the intent, so that I could just turn around and um, and grab my book. But I, I'm I'm so happy now that it is there <laughs> that, it is that way that I can do that. Um, let's see. I want to read this because the last time this quote came to me. I wasn't able to find my book. And um, this time, uh, and Nicaea is here this time. It's so funny. Yeah. But this time I can find my book because I want to read Marianne Williamson's quote. Actually, I'm, I'm like sitting up there thinking to myself, I said, I used to know exactly what page it was on. And, um, and I'm flipping through here because I know what the highlighted page looks like. And so I am just trying to find it. But but that I think that is um I think that that is the issue with so many of us is is that we try not to outshine other people, right? Mm -hmm. And we are trying not to outshine other people. We dumb down for other folks' comfort. And then in dumbing down, it becomes one of those things that we forget. We're so busy dumbing down that at a certain point, we get stuck in the dumb down. Right. Well, it becomes, ah, it becomes more comfortable. Um because we're not being challenged mm -hmm. it doesn't it doesn't activate any type of um neural system stuff that goes on or you know being rejected or abandoned mm -hmm. um doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, you know what I'm finding everything but what I want to find I'm just flipping here and um, I know it's right here. 
high. And for some reason, I it is not, thank you, God, for letting this jump out at me. Because I am. Um, like maybe you're supposed to recite it from memory. Our greatest fear. <laughs> <laughs> I tried that before. And, um, and but I used to know what Egypt was in, on. It was on one, one. Maybe I haven't gone back enough, far enough in the book because I'm still. Um, I used to tell people what page it was on too. I tell you, see, that's part of the issue too. Is, is, is that we stop doing stuff, and then when you stop doing it, it becomes like you get rusty in that particular area. I think I found the quote. Is it our deepest fear? Is not that we are inadequate. Yes, that one? is it. Our deepest yes, fear is that, that is we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, courageous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not? Of course, it's shrinking. I can't see it. Um, who are you not to be? Here it is. It's on 165. Hey! <laughs> So, um, so uh, who are you to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small doesn't serve the world. Mm -hmm. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. Oh, so good. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. Yes. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. I love that. That's good. And it's true. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, and so this thing is, is I'm, I'm going to stick a, another sticky note in here. because A different I color have, one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't think I have any of these in here. So, uh, so I'm going to grab my green uh Thing and I'm going to stick it but but see how I got well I don't know if you guys can see that yeah. but I got all this stuff sticking out of this book <laughs> um papers and all kind of stuff I don't even know why this paper is in here this one is dealing with money um I'm gonna throw this away so that I don't have to um let me I'm gonna read this quote on this page that I have um I got several of them on here um but I'm going to read this one right quick. How could Leonardo da Vinci not, how could Leonardo da Vinci not have painted? How could Shakespeare not have written? In letters to, to a young poet, Reich tells a young writer to write only if he has to. We are to do what there is a deep psychological and emotional imperative for us to do. Hmm. That's our point of power, the source of our brilliance. Our power is not rationally or willfully called forth. It is a divine dispensation <laughs> and act of grace. I love wow. That. What page was that? That is on 166 in my book, but okay. you I'll know, just I, check and see. I, yeah. yeah. It's under, under work and the section is called um what it's at the end of the section called personal power yeah because uh you know i have um I, you know how i was telling you about i i this is like my favorite life-changing book mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um 
And so I used to buy extra copies just to give them away to people. So when I was changing around my office, I found a couple of extra copies, but they are paperback. Okay. And the size is different from my book. So I don't know if the page numbers correspond to my okay. book. Or not. That's why okay. I'm kind of hesitant. But I've got, you know, I've got two more copies that I was just like willing to give away. So if somebody ever wants a copy of Miriam Williamson's A Return to Love, which is what I always tell people is, um, it was one of the, it, it started me on a whole new life trajectory and um, it was pivotal in, in my thing. So I have gone on to find many, many good books since then, but I don't know that that they have had the same type of deep effect that that book did okay. in reordering my steps. Mm. Yeah. The Carolyn Mace uh, is close, right? Right. Um, <laughs> it makes me more conscious and more aware. Yeah. But Miriam Williamson, uh, when I was on that treadmill, she was like, oh, wait a minute, look you know, there is a purpose and a plan for your existence. And, uh, and so, yeah, maybe I need to put my picture of me and Mary Ann up behind me too. Oh, that would be good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Inspirational. Yeah. I got, I got all the other important people in my life up there. So maybe <laughs> I, I should put that up there. So, um, so here is this thing where, where we have to ask ourselves the question um, about what does it mean to be loyal to oneself, right? Um, some of the things that, that you are doing, I'm wondering if you ask yourself a question like, if I loved myself, would I do this? If I had... Um, if I had an ambition for my life, would this be what I was doing? You know, mm -hmm. I don't even know if that's the way I want to phrase it, but, but it, 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 it becomes a question, a questioning that we have to do of ourselves, asking ourselves what it looks like to be loyal to yourself, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so for each of us, that may mean something different. Sometimes well, it definitely means, it will, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it means um, you know, something as simple as, you know, telling people you can't talk to me that way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or 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 not having somebody in your space that's constantly demeaning you or criticizing you. Yeah. Or yeah. You know, so what does that mean to be loyal to yourself? And sometimes that's the struggle. That's the sweet struggle that we have to go through in order to figure out, you know, how what we're doing with ourselves and our energy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can have, um, sometimes you can recognize in the midst of things, like, I don't know if you've ever done this, but um, sometimes you get into situations or you get around people and you know that you feel like you're being drained, right? Mm -hmm. You know it. Nobody has to tell you. Or sometimes you're sitting up there and you're wondering like, whoa, you know, what is this I'm feeling? You know? Well, yeah, because I see seven to eight to 10 people a day with stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm either pouring out energy or I'm almost, um, how's my girlfriend and I try to, you almost trying to fight off. Like, like a lot of times I'll be like, I need to go get a green tea so that I can stay up like present because a lot of times you are actually um, like creating this force field around you so that you can be objective when you're talking to people to help them because especially for me because I'm a helper and I'm a proclaimer so mm -hmm. it is much easier for me to proclaim this is what I'm you know and so but I know that the brain needs to have the moment for it to click on and the best way for the brain to click on is for me to declare my truth 
So I'm having to sit a lot of times and holding in energy or awarenesses because I have to wait for somebody to kind of catch up and their mm-hmm. energy is like trying to pull. And I'm like, I can't say you need to come to this so that we can now move forward and talk about it. And so that whole energy exchange, like literally you can actually feel it. And the more in tune, the more I am aware to this intuition piece, the more I am aware of the lot of times when I thought energy drainage or something else, you know, I didn't call it that. Right, right, right. And I didn't so, call it that. So isn't this a powerful <laughs> piece to, to incorporate now into yeah. to that awareness? Yeah. And, and so you can feel it. You can feel it when it's taking a dip. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you want to speak to it. And other times you want to just, okay, um, sit there and think, yeah, like I'm going to put up a barrier or a force field. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, and, and so all of that becomes an interesting dynamic, especially, you know, even, even like in, in ministry too, it, it becomes this thing of like, okay yeah because people learn through other teachings that they need to judge folks or that they need to um create a us and them kind of mentality we over here christians and i don't know what y'all are but you know they we they want to somehow the black and white yeah yeah they want to they want to they want to and, and that judgment, that judgment in, is in and of itself problematic because that judgment is what is polluting our system and we don't even know it. We think that we're doing it from a place of superiority or that God somehow needs us to do that. And we were told specifically, judge ye not. Yeah, right? but I think sometimes instead of if people hearing or saying or communicating certain things they don't consider as judgment they consider as informing and protecting the group alliance and 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 the allegiance to the group setting um we could talk about tomorrow i'll make myself a note to talk about um the cave the plato cave story isn't it plato yes yes the allegory of the cave like it's that is you know that's it that Well, you know, and 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 that that particular allegory plays out in our lives because so say for instance, um, I used to have some tenants. Ah, I used to have these tenants, and um, they used to um, their world seemed to me to be so small, right? And they used to they used to argue and fight um, about stupid stuff that just seems like most people would you know fifty cents is like becomes a I had two quarters right there you know and you're you're listening to this crazy <laughs> thinking like really I'm gonna bring down two quarters for y'all so you would stop the fighting I mean it was. And their world and the way they saw it to them was real. I mean, it or was, they could have been you know, acorns with giant oak trees on the inside and didn't know what to do with it. Well, well, <laughs> but the, they weren't. They weren't even in that awareness, right? They wow. were. Everything was a struggle. Everything, like life, seemed like to them from their definition um this adversarial thing and you were just fighting they were in total survival mode and it was always um this friction and this fight and the tension was what i just um couldn't bear and you know it it but what they were looking at to them seemed real just like in the allegory of the cave what they their perception seemed really real Mm-hmm. And when somebody would try to turn on the light or to try to say, hey, you know, you can choose differently. Like 
there's more than 50 cents available. You know, we, oh we gosh, people right? just go and buy a $2 case of water and go to the street and sell them for a dollar a bottle. We got a corner right there. Well, you know, you could turn that $2 into 30, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just by putting a smile on your face and going to sell some water. Right. But, but no, it's, it's, they rather fight over 50 cents. So even when the light was trying to enter the room, they was like, get that, get that. Right. It's not real. Ooh. We don't know where you've been and who's tainted you. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. you know, all of that is, um, is a part of this. So, um, so I'm going to read this and then I guess we can, we can close out. Yeah. Um, you said good. good right on time okay <laughs> okay so um julia attended one of my workshops this is from uh carolyn miss again julia attended okay. one of my workshops because she was suffering from serious ovarian and breast cancer her marriage was dysfunctional as it had been for several years and she wanted to heal her her cancer but she lived with a man who treated her with total contempt a pattern that had begun two years after they were married. So she goes through and she talks about um, all of this stuff with the friction and the problems that exist in between her and the, her and her husband. Now, um, a lot of times when we read these things and we, we'll think to ourselves like, oh, I don't have contempt towards that person or, oh, I don't do this or they don't do that. But it, it may not be that what you're hearing is may not fit, but when you really analyze what you are going through, what does fit? Mm -hmm. Is it that somebody is browbeating you? Because sometimes that happens. Is it that um, they have an expectation that you should be different than how you actually are? Because sometimes too, that can have and carry with it this or make you feel shameful, guilty, inadequate, um, any number of things. And until we learn how to, sometimes I'll say we could, we should ask for what it is that we desire, right? But just because you ask for the thing that you desire doesn't mean that you will get it nor have it respected. And so mm -hmm. it becomes this struggle. It's a, it's a struggle. And so if the struggle is not one that at some point you feel as if um, you're being seen or being heard over time, that can begin to leave you feeling totally powerless, totally unseen, totally unrespected, and in ways that you had not anticipated. So part of it is, is, is getting clear on what it is that you need out of a relationship. And if you have the ability to ask for it, or if it is capable of being delivered. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have to know, um, we have to know the difference between those two, right? That's, that's the serenity <laughs> prayer, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah, so the wisdom to accept the things that I can, that I can, or God First grant change. me. Uh, mm -hmm. the, right. To accept the things I, I, I cannot I, change. The courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Yeah, yeah, the courage to think to, yeah. Yes, the things that you can change, those that you can't, and the wisdom to know the difference. And so when you figure that out, um because you know it, my mother you know i would hear people say no sense in beating a dead horse right <laughs> and i think you're always figuring it out i don't I mean because life is a journey mm -hmm. i think you're always figuring it out and i think that the serenity prayer is is always is is a combination lock on the journey so mm -hmm. and when you get to a place of stuck energy or no power at all it, it, you can, you know, surrender and say, you know, universe, I surrender. I submit all of this to you, you know, give me the courage to accept the thing, change the things that I can't and the wisdom 
to know the difference. Like, give me that. And I think that that that's a part of the journey on for like, not just a one and done. I think that's just a language for the journey. It, you know, I feel like, you know, if there's um, abracadabra words, mm-hmm. which I do believe there are, like that is one. The serenity prayer is an abracadabra for my, <laughs> okay. um, because I'm a warrior and I want to be in control and I want to know how it is. Girl, I was watching the matrix yesterday and there's one part of it that I never get to watch because I get up and be like, I'm not watching that. I don't even know. My mother was like, well, how do you know what happens? I was like, she was like, you don't even have anybody in there to tell you what's going to happen. Next. I was like, well, whatever. I will try to figure it out. I don't remember the part. I don't know, but it was like, oh, I don't even like this music. I'm getting up. And I waited until the music changed. What part was that? I don't know. I don't, well, I don't, what happened to right, right, hap, what, what happened I, before it? Oh. Were they getting ready to try to kill Morpheus? Were they beating him up really bad? Or oh, with the with the thing what where that's the part that I was talking about. Neo was speaking directly to Morpheus and he was like, No, Get not that Morpheus. part. It was before that. Oh, it was before that. It was before. So, Maybe oh, when so they were the um having to pull the plug, I don't know. But the anyway. agent, yeah, the agent was having a conversation with Morpheus, and he was like, "You know what I hate about this place?" He was like, "You're like a virus." Yeah, and no, this was like it was like about. fighting and beating up and like that. It was the more aggressive part. Oh, in the bathroom scene, probably so. I don't okay. know, but I yeah. just know that there was a part that I'll have to keep watching, it and it's like I've watched the Matrix before, and I just <laughs> happened to be aware of this time that oh my goodness I'm getting up and I was in I was walking out the room and I was like you know doing like oh my god Stephanie you gotta learn how to sit in this <laughs> my mother walked past and she was like what are you doing <laughs> yeah and, uh, I told her what I was doing she was like well when do you ever know how I was like mom I don't know but this part I can't sit in this for whatever reason but I'm gonna master it but I don't know how I just listen to the music to change and then I come back in the room Oh, wow. So, you know, Morpheus <laughs> lives through that. I mean, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know what the story is. I've watched it before. But I just yeah. think it's comical that, you know, my control, my not, you know, not um, wanting to see the violence and all that, even though I know how it ends, something inside of me is like, I don't have control over this. I got to get up right now. I got to get up. Yeah. It's some, it's some nervous system thing for me. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that that movie is just so amazing to me. And um and I, the the interesting thing is is now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know that you see blood in the movie. Um you do? It's kind of like okay. the it's kind of like the it's the teller tale sign when you are operating from the matrix and another place it's like when you are kind of like living in two places is where blood can show up when you're not fully in your highest self so you'll watch it again and see yeah but i just noticed that because i remember that- i remember them putting this finger over a wound because I, I you know you you rarely see um, the thing, or or they turn into an agent, or the agent when they kill, um, when they shoot at the agent, and the agent dies, then it's like another person may come into mm-hmm. that, into that body or something like that. So I was trying to figure out if you actually, uh, you see a lot of bullets, but I don't know that I saw blood. Yeah. So when you watch it this time, see the when you see the blood, you know that it's the dichotomy that's going on okay. right here. It's this paradox that's happening. Okay. Okay. So I'm that's how I saw it. Okay. Well, this you was guys, good. Yeah, guys, it is time for us to um to let this go and to um, you know, I got my stuff over here that I have to pick up and um and deal with. And yeah. um Sending you love and light. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I am um yeah, I got I got stuff. So I, I want you to have an amazing Monday. Yes, thank you. And trust that all things are working for your good, your yes. highest, your highest good. Yes, yes, yes. 
And so um, as we leave this company of one another, I am just blessing you on this day in your journey, knowing that the light of God surrounds you, the love of God enfolds you, the power of God protects you, the presence of God watches over you wherever you are, wherever you are. Hmm. Ah, wherever you are, God is. You know, sometimes we don't understand why stuff happens, um, but I trust, I trust, I trust that all things are working for our good. Yes. And we stand in agreement with you right now this morning. Amen. 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 All, right. all right. Try to have an amazing rest of your day. I will. Thank all you. Right. All right. Bye. All right, and uh, it's, I'm still on. <laughs> Sometimes this, I, I tell you, it's just as slow trying to get on as it is trying to get off. So um, yeah, yeah, keep us in prayer. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't know. All right, so let's see. Still doing its thing. I love you. And it is through Dallas exercises just like that, that you get to a point where you recognize and know that you are a perfect child of God, that you are worthy of, of the life that you desire of having your best. And, and you change around your whole energy and how you see the world when you make a commitment to yourself. So just try that. Just try it. You know, if you do it once, try it 10 times tomorrow, try it 20. Just start saying, I love you to yourself. Look yourself in the eyeball and, and know that there is a spirit that is you that is listening and it will get in agreement with that estimation of yourself. Ah, oh, I tell you, it's so amazing. All right. See ya.